Good evening and welcome to Colorado Decides, a joint production of Colorado Public Television and CBS4. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Joining me as always is political analyst Eric Sonderman. Our series kicks off tonight as we take a look at the race for the U.S. Senate seat in Colorado. Tonight's debate features the alternate party and unaffiliated candidates running for the seat currently held by Mark Udall. Join us for the next 30 minutes are Bill Hammonds, running as the Unity Party candidate, Galen Kent, running as the Libertarian Party candidate, and Dr. Steve Shogan, running as an unaffiliated candidate. Everyone, thank you very much for joining us. We have limited time, so let's get right to it. Eric, would you start us off? Thank you indeed for being here. You have a tough road to hoe here. I'm not breaking any news here. Um, third party candidates, uh, there's some track record of an occasional win, but usually you guys are referred to as sacrificial lambs. I'm curious, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What drives you? What prompted you to do this? Why are you here today? Steve, why don't we start with you and come down the panel? Well, first of all, Eric and uh, Dominic, thank you very much for having us here. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that what gets me out of the bed, out of bed every day, and the reason that I'm doing this is that I really feel like our system is incredibly broken, and that we need to and can do a lot better than we're doing, and we need to do that both for ourselves, but especially for our future generations. And um, I think that there is a pathway to victory for an independent candidate like myself. Uh, the largest single group of people in the state are unaffiliated or independents, and I believe that uh, if we pull together that we actually can make a significant change in our government and take things back for the people. Keelan? The doctor makes a very good point. Our country is broken. I believe the purpose of government is to provide for the liberty of its citizens, and the United States could be doing a lot better job of that. Um, uh, certainly would be an upset win. I am nobody here is the odds on favorite. However, the right message at the right time, combined with an electric that's one third independent, uh, certainly I think a uh, third party candidate that has the right message at the right time can win in November. Bill. Well, two things. We need voter choice. Uh, the two major party candidates, they're good men, but they're in a broken system. Same thing I said in 2008 when I ran for U.S. House. Uh, one reason that, uh, that is different from these two gentlemen is I am the first Unity Party of America candidate to make the ballot as a U.S. Senate candidate. As a direct result, uh, we are a voter affiliation option here in the states. And uh, you know, one I am running, and I would love to win. I would love to be the upset in November. But also, uh, this is party building and getting a message across. Let me take the whole idea of you know, why you're into the next level. We have a country where uh, the, pres the president's approval ratings are pretty low. The congressional approval ratings are <laughs> dismal. Uh, people are angry about politics. Whether, wherever they're at on the spectrum, if they're conservative or liberal, uh, they're angry about the way it's going. Uh, gridlock, they don't, the, the, the trust of elected officials is remarkably low. And Colorado is known as a purple state with all, all these different unaffiliated independent voters that really decide elections in Colorado. Colorado. With all that being said, this, if you lay that out as uh, uh, a description, as a story problem in a political theory class, it'd be like, well, yes, then an alternate party or ind uh, independent candidate would walk away with this. What is stopping that? What, what is the biggest hurdle to uh, really taking advantage of all these different things that make it look like on paper the perfect scenario? And Bill, we'll start with you. Well, the biggest thing is momentum. Like we were discussing uh, before the cameras started rolling. When p people see that you're going somewhere, um, they tend to jump. Uh, they tend to uh, join the momentum, and it is a struggle uh, with third parties because we are. Uh, one of the things I am strongly opposed to is uh, gerrymandering. Uh, the drawing of congressional districts along partisan lines, that is creating uh, only major party uh, members of Congress in the U.S. House, and you know they don't even, they don't have to listen to anybody other than their own uh, the more extreme members of their own parties. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Colorado being purple. It's really what, you know, my experience uh, petitioning onto the ballot this summer, it's really a red-blue swirl. Um, you know, throwing out there, uh, you know, moderate positions I think is going to appeal to everybody, that's not going to work. What's really, mm -hmm. what really works is, uh, you know, I support balanced budget amendments, I support term limits for Congress. As I mentioned, I support uh, the outlaw of gerrymandering. If you find what some might think of as uh, strong positions, let's use that word, uh, you will appeal to people from across the spectrum. You know, and when I was petitioning, um, you know, a lot of people, they're out there, they're open to the question, let's put it that way. 
Galen, same question to you. What's, what's stopping this from, uh, because on paper it looks like a perfect scenario? Human nature. As human beings, we are resistant to change. Um, third party candidate would be the ultimate change. Uh, and we stick with what's familiar even when it is not serving us well. Hmm. And we have done that throughout the history of this republic. Uh, we have always been a two-party system since President Washington left office. And so our biggest challenge is overcoming human nature. Steve. Well, I think there are really two things that, uh, that keep this going. And one is money, that there is a huge amount of money which exists with special interests. And that makes things much more difficult on a third-party candidate. Um, in addition to that, as everyone has, al has already said, um, momentum and being able to take that leap of faith is the other thing that keeps us from doing this. But I think we've seen in this election cycle already that money isn't the only thing that, uh, that really rules the roost here and that we've already seen one example in Virginia where um, we were, it was pointed out to us pretty clearly that money doesn't vote, but people vote. And that's the, our hope in this election. Eric? We'll get to some issues here, but let me ask one more general question before we move a little more specific. And it's what I call the Ralph Nader question, dialing the clock back to 2000 in Florida, that uh, very close election between Al Gore and George W. Bush. Let's hypothesize here that it's election day here a few weeks from now, and Cory Gardner and Mark Udall are locked in just a neck and neck struggle. And that one of you, by pulling 5,000 votes, 10,000 votes, maybe 30,000 votes, tips that election one way or the other. How would that feel, and can you live with that? And Galen, why don't we go to you, and then to Dr. Shogun, and down here to Bill. Oh, I would be disappointed, because I didn't win. Um, it's common to say, I have been asked to leave the race mm -hmm. by a Republican from Colorado Springs, so I think saw me speak down there. Um, he said, you're taking votes from Mr. Gardner. Well, they're taking votes from me, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, any American citizen who casts a vote in, a, in an election is in no way wasting his vote. So, no, I would feel, um, I would feel disappointed because I didn't win, honestly. Steve? And I would agree. I'm really not in this election to, uh, to try to be a spoiler by any means. I really am in this election to win. And so, just as, as Galen has said, um, I think that this is uh, an instance where, no, I don't think that I would feel badly. I really feel that we are giving the people a different option to vote for, and that in and of itself is going to be really valuable and something which is crucial. And in many ways, with the independents representing the largest population in this state, in some ways there is uh, more of a, a legitimacy to this campaign than to either the Democrats or the Republicans. I've been accused of being actually an agent for both the Democrats and the Republicans, and in some ways that actually feels kind of good. It means we must be making some inroads. I know the feeling of that when this station says, well, you're too liberal, you're too conservative. When we're, we're getting complaints from both, we're doing it right. Bill, go ahead and finish it up. Thank you for asking the question. Now, I will be drawing votes from both sides. Uh, when I was petitioning, I was got, I gathered over close to 200 signatures in the town of Monuments, not exactly the liberal bastion. Um, also gathered uh, signatures in my hometown of Boulder, Frisco, you name it. Uh, a lot of signatures from Colorado Springs, even though I never quite made it down to Colorado Springs when I was petitioning across the board. You know, support balanced budget amendment, federal term limits. Position in other positions that appeal to people across a wide spectrum. So if and it is going to be a very close race between the two major party candidates, um, but you know definitely they won't be able to accuse me of throwing the race to one or the other because I'm going to be drawing votes from either side. And I should point out there there is a Libertarian candidate in this race, but there's no Green Party candidate, there's no American Constitution Party candidate in this race, and they're a major party nowadays here in the mm -hmm. state. So all those folks can vote for me, and I think I'll balance out. I hope so. Well, let's get into the issues. One of the issues has been brought up about uh, where Senator Udall has uh, placed his votes, um, come under criticism from really both sides of the spectrum, has been on the Keystone XL pipeline. Now, that doesn't go through Colorado, but it brings up a lot about uh, energy and how that is produced and really transported in the United States. That's a huge issue for Colorado. It's a huge issue for uh, our economy. and. Whether or not, whatever stance he's going to take, it seems that being in the middle has been criticized. Would you vote for the approval of the Keystone XL pipeline if elected? And what's your viewpoint of how we're producing energy here in Colorado? Uh, Steve, I think it's your turn. 
Well, I'll give you a short answer to that, so I'm not accused of trying to dodge the question, and then I'll give you the more nuanced answer. Um, overall, I, I would tell you that, yes, I would vote in favor of the Keystone Pipeline. I think that the five years of studying that's been done for that is more than enough, and I think that we have the information, and that the major reason that it's not being voted on right now is in order to avoid causing a problem politically for the uh, Democratic candidates. But I think that this is looking at the Keystone Pipeline in just a vacuum. And really, what we need to have is a comprehensive energy policy. And it's going to be very important for us to have a secure and abundant supply of energy in this country. And we could see even last night in the, in the remarks by President Obama that we have a major problem across our world with that a uh, major defensive problem and that we really need to have a secure energy supply which will provide for us both economically and also will provide for our defense. So I would be in favor of things that we can do to have a secure oil supply and other fossil fuels because we are not going to be able in the foreseeable future to get rid of fossil fuels and also a program to gradually transition towards renewables as well. Galen? I would support it. I think it's the uh, purpose of government to uh, uh, facilitate uh, free market for private business, and if uh, and if that is a uh, uh, reliable energy source, then let's do it. Other than that, that big picture view, I am unable to really comment on that. Okay, Bill. Hands down against Keystone. Uh, global warming is real. Global warming is man-made. Global warming is a problem, and we can do something about it. And Keystone is a step in the opposite direction. Uh, here in Colorado, we get 300 days of sunshine a year. We get plenty of wind on the eastern plains. We can tap those renewable resources worldwide, especially here in Colorado. Uh, we use the resources of the federal government to encourage alternative forms of energy. Uh, as uh, one of my opponents mentioned, uh, right now in the Middle East, one of the issues is that uh, Iraq and other countries are still major sources of oil, potentially or otherwise. And if we can give ourselves more flexibility in terms of our energy policy, we can go after terrorists for beheadings, take them out, be a much simpler battle versus uh, having to choose our battles over forms of energy. Uh, that's tying up our uh, foreign policy. And uh, so hands down, uh, I'm you know, against Keystone, and I think that we just, uh, there are other options out there. Eric. Steve made reference in his last answer to the president's speech, uh, September 10th speech recently on ISIL and uh, and, and related issues. I'm curious what each of you make of this threat of the president's response and of the role of Congress in this process. Uh, why don't we mix it up, start with Bill and go down. ISIS is a threat. Uh, we need to do something about ISIS. However, we need to stay out of Iraq. Uh, as I was telling people on the campaign trail all summer, we need, my position is still we need to stay out of Iraq. Um, however, we don't, shouldn't stay away from Iraq. We can still use airstrikes. Um, I might support, we already have over a thousand special forces on the ground. Uh, just the nature of airstrikes, uh, you have to have a limited number of uh, specialized forces on the ground to guide those strikes. I do think that is appropriate. But we don't need boots on the ground, definitely nothing like what we last saw in Iraq a few years ago. Uh, right now, the American public might support um, action in the region, even major action. I do think that Congress uh, should be given the option to uh, debate the issue and give the president authority that he needs. I would support uh, the president's plan to uh, train quote unquote moderate uh, Syrian rebels as, uh, and back them up with airstrikes to defeat ISIS. Um, but we have to be you know, realistic. Um, the, the American public, exactly a year ago, they were 100%, 99, literally 99% against uh, this sort of action in this region. And you know, things can change, and we need to keep that in mind. Kim. The United States must give every nation the dignity of conducting their affairs without U.S. interference. We have no business being in Iraq or any other nation. Uh, if we do this, this would result in a more peaceful world. Uh, the earth is like a sandbox when we were children. The bullies in the sandbox, it's not a happy sandbox. America's a bully right now, let's be honest. We are butting in everywhere and we are not solving anything. And all we are doing is making people mad at us. Threats against America would, I think, disappear if we butted out of every other nation's business. Steve. 
Well, respectfully, I guess I would disagree with that. I think that unfortunately that there are evil people in the world and these people are a threat to our nation and to the people in our country and we've already seen that um, in the attacks that have occurred on our country. So I do see ISIL as a threat to uh, this nation and I think that action does need to be taken. I would hope that uh, the President and Congress would work together in concert um, to present a united front in dealing with them. And then I would hope that we would use all of the tools that we have to try to, um, to, try to fight against those uh, perpetrators in the Middle East. I think that we need to use our economic power, our diplomatic power, somewhat our military power, and I think we also have another moral power that we have not used to as great a degree as we really should, that the stronger that our nation is and the more that we can get back to once again being a real beacon of light to the world, that that can make a big difference. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, has been one of the hottest political hot buttons of the last couple of years. Um, the Republican uh, House uh, in, in Congress has voted to repeal it. It's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, President Obama still has two years of his uh, term left. So the repealing of the law is not going to happen. But as any law, it could be amended. So let me just ask my question this simply. If you were elected to the U.S. Senate, would you push for an amendment to the Affordable Care Act? And if so, what would it be? Steve, we'll start with you. Well, I have... Uh three decades of experience in the medical field and I have definitely very strong feelings about Obamacare. I think that Obamacare is a fatally flawed system that really is uh, not going to be able to do what it's set out to do and I think that we need to um, when you say amend it, I would say more replace it and that we can do much better than Obamacare and provide care for all Americans. So the plan that I would bring forward would be, would be a two-tiered plan, the first tier of which would provide care for all Americans at a certain level to provide basic health care. We would have a dedicated funding stream for that tier of care. On top of that would be a second tier of care where if you desired to have something more in terms of coverage, you would be able to purchase that on a very robust free market system. But I think that a good and great country provides health care for all of its citizens, and that's what I would be in favor of. Galen. It's not the purpose of government to require citizens and businesses to purchase anything, be it health insurance or a radish. Um, so I would, um, I would not vote for anything that would, I would leave Obamacare alone. What I would do is I support bringing doctors and health insurers back into the free market. There is no reason for doctors and health insurers to not have the same access to the free market that a lawyer has or a plumber has or I as a writer have. Um, once we do that, once doctors are able to uh, charge what they can get for their services, uh, we're a wealthy nation. Then we can take care of whatever, whatever other problems remain. But uh, no, Obamacare is uh, it's not in the spirit of American liberty. Support no amendments, actually doing away with Obamacare altogether. We need Medicare for all. Uh, drop the eligibility age from 65 to zero. Streamline Medicare. Medicare is not a perfect system, but it's been in place for decades and decades, and a lot of people are very happy with Medicare. Uh, so Medicare for all system. I do not support the system of Obamacare where, people, again, people are forced to pay for their own health coverage. I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, I don't think it's uh, the uh, place of really any businesses to be required to provide health care for their employees. I think we need to move to a much broader, simplified system to where everybody is granted health care with modest co-pays uh, to control costs and so people can take res responsibility for their own health care. Um, but, uh, you know, make it uh, available for all. And just it's much more comp Obamacare is much more complicated than uh, our health care system needs to be. And if I can just you know, comment again on that, one thing I would say, um, although I agree with some of what uh, Bill has to say, Medicare itself is on a path right now to become bankrupt in the uh, mid-2020s, and we really can't continue on that path either. And there needs to be a different way of funding health care in this country. We need to have a real dedicated funding stream to whatever health care program we have. And in response to what Galen had to say, Unfortunately, the free market system really just does not work well in a system like medicine. You don't want to have your doctor negotiating with you over fees when you have some major medical problem. 
Let me, uh, well, again, if you have a quick response, go ahead, and then we'll get to I have a question. great deal of respect for what the doctor said, um, but I think um, doctors should be in competition with, every, with their fellow practitioners as everyone else is. Uh, the AARP is a major sponsor of uh, these debates here on Colorado, Colorado Public Television. Uh, they have uh, proposed a question for all of our Senate candidates, so I'll ask to, uh, it to you. How would you protect Social Security for today's seniors and then strengthen it for future generations? We're just talking about a major national program. Uh, I think last time we started with Steve, so Bill, we'll start with you. Social Security type pool. Uh, take all the uh, Social Security taxes that we currently have and pool those on an annual basis and uh, pay out Social Security benefits on an annual basis uh, every fiscal year. So, and also give uh, seniors the option of buying Social Security insurance. Uh, because if you pool Social Security revenues um, based on taxes, the uh, revenue pool is going to vary from year to year. That's just the nature, uh, nature of the setup. But if you, uh, but you can also give seniors the option to buy insurance if their benefits, if they see their benefits are going to be going, uh, be going down. There are people, you mentioned the free markets. There are uh, plenty of uh, people out there in the free markets who are willing to bet that uh, benefits are going to go up or down and be willing to insure, uh, insure those benefits so that uh, seniors uh, are guaranteed a uh, income uh, year on year for life. Galen. Social Security will best be benefited by a flourishing economy, and that can best be done with low taxes and free markets. Uh, low taxes and free markets historically have ensured a flourishing economy, which means more people are working, businesses are prospering, and they're paying higher wages, which would mean more money for uh, so more Social Security tax receipts. Uh, that is the overall big picture solution to Social Security. Steve. Well, I really don't think that that's the case. I really think that the economy in and of itself is not going to be enough to really solve the Social Security problem. Social Security is really on a pathway right now to become bankrupt in 2032 or thereabouts. And we really need to have a hard conversation with America and say that we cannot afford to either have the same benefits or to have the same revenue streams. We either need to increase the revenue stream or we need to decrease the benefits. I've spelled out a six-point plan of what I would do in order to shore up Social Security. We're going to need, I think, to increase the retirement age, the um, retirement age where you would receive maximum benefits to 69, and then peg it to life expectancy. This hasn't been changed since the 1980s. We need to change the way that cost of living is calculated. We need to increase the amount of income that the Social Security tax is based upon. And there are a number of other things that are spelled out on my website that I talk about in order to make Social Security fiscally viable for at least the next 75 years. Once we've done that, we can start to look at some of the underlying things that we would want to do to change the overall system and make it more viable for future generations. But we need to at least do this to keep it on a fiscal footing, which will provide for all of our seniors. Well, one thing we know for sure in Colorado decides a half hour goes by very quickly. It's time for our closing statements of one minute apiece. We picked numbers out of a hat before the taping began. Steve, you go first. Well, like so many other Coloradans, I really am pretty fed up with the Democrats and the Republicans. Both the major political parties and the big money special interests, which they represent, have brought Washington to a near complete standstill. They've created government sequesters and they've created government shutdowns. We need a new voice in Washington. We need a powerful swing vote in the Senate that will really start to get things moving again. I won't be afraid to bring real tough solutions to the critical problems that we face in this country. When you think about it, really the biggest wasted vote would be for us to continue to return the same politicians to Congress that have brought about the problems that we have right now. So I would hope that the people of Colorado would consider voting for me, Steve Shogan, an independent for the United States Senate. And I would promise the people of Colorado that the only special interest that I would be concerned about would be Coloradans and the citizens of the United States. Thank you, Steve. Galen, your one minute. Friends, throughout history, it has been common to ask, if not us, who? And if not now, when? That question resonates this election season. We can either continue to tolerate a substandard government, or we can accept the challenge of making our government right. I am running for the United States Senate because I've accepted that challenge, and I want you to accept the challenge with me.
Now, it's not easy to leave the safety of what's familiar. However, our government is a fractured, partisan, bickering mess. And it is up to you and I, concerned and conscientious citizens, to make it right. It starts with you, and it starts with me, and it starts on Election Day. Thank you. Gillen, thank you. Bill, your one minute. As I mentioned before, uh, one of the reasons I ran is to get to the Unity Party on the voter affiliation form. Uh, you can choose uh, Unity on your voter registration form. Once we have 1,000 registered voters, we'll be a, a full-fledged party, recognized as a full-fledged party here in the States, and we'll be able to field any candidate for any office starting in 2016. So I certainly hope that you affiliate with the Unity Party, and also I hope that you'll vote for me on November 4th. It's Bill Hammonds, uh, www.unityparty.us is our national website. We are in 34 states. Also, facebook.com slash unitypartybill. And also, I could use your support at uh, gofundme.com slash Unity Party of America. Thank you. Well, this is all the time we have for a look at the race for the U.S. Senate. I'd like to thank our candidates for joining us, Bill Hammonds, Galen Kent, Steve Shogan. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, Eric Sonderman. If you'd like to find out more information about any of the races on this November's ballot, please visit our websites at cpt12.org or cbs4denver.com. And be sure to stay tuned immediately after this debate for a look at the governor's race with the alternate party and unaffiliated candidates. Also be sure to tune in for our special high school debate series, Both Sides of the Story, premieres Wednesday, September 24th at 7 p.m. as two very talented high school students take a look at both sides of Proposition 105, which would mandate labeling of genetically modified food. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.